using it, thinking all the time that we are bringing about liberation and humanitarianism. And so it is for this reason I feel that we should also understand both the potential of international law and also the deficiencies of international law and we need a vocabulary in which to do it. And that vocabulary comes from theory. So the other thing that I, was, uh, that I often encounter when I visit some of these countries is they say, well, we just want to teach the subject to the students. The students are not interested in theory. And my claim is, without theory, you are going to be fundamentally disabled. Because it is theory that governs what you see. And if your theory is taken from the West, then even if you look at your own reality, what you will be seeing is just an inadequate version of the West. Can we see that? Theory is the lens. And if the lens is Western and only Western, then even if you are looking at your own situation, what you are looking at will be inevitably deficient because the West has its own paradigms as it should. But the West would say, well, actually, you don't have Westphalian sovereignty. You've got some other weird barbaric backward system, and we need to remedy that, and therefore, we need to bring in these political institutions and so forth to bring about this transformation. So this is what I mean by decolonization, going back to Mr. Justice Langer, to change the theoretical lens so that scholars, uh, people living in other countries will be able to perhaps see their own reality in, it, in their own terms, rather than terms dictated by this lens, which is something that has been derived from the West. Well, Professor Beinart was an expert on uh, Roman law, and another very interesting development is taking place uh, in terms of the history of international law, and that is the development in terms of trying to understand how Roman law was actually the foundation of international law in many important respects. Uh, so it is a great pity that we cannot have a conversation with Professor Beinart about this very compelling topic. I'm sure we would have had a lot to learn. Thank you very much. Professor Angie has taken us on a wonderful theoretical and conceptual journey. And now I'm going to open up the floor for questions. We have quite a few of our academic staff here who uh, will teach international law, will teach constitutional law, but they refer to the international. So, Kathy, I'll take about three questions at a time. And maybe say who you are, okay? Yes. For the recording, for the purposes of the recording. Hello, Kathy Powell, I teach international law at UCT. First of all, thanks for a fascinating, really engaging, gripping lecture. Let me understand you correctly. You are not saying, well, you were saying, but I disagree with you, that the Westphalian system can't encompass the concept of imperialism. If anything, it provided the basis for imperialism. Good. Um, <laughs> you're, you're going a step beyond me now. <laughs> well, but what you are saying is it doesn't provide the conceptual tools by which we can address imperialism, colonialism, and so on. And and that's so you talk about the need for theory. I mean it, it makes us all I'm sure want to follow up trail yeah. and see what conceptual tools it does provide, but yeah. if you could give us something of a primer, that, that would be great. Sure. Um, what I'm particularly interested in, because you gave two historical starting points, and they're very different, yeah, they and then they lead to very different sets of conceptual tools. Yeah. One is the role of non-state actors in what is considered an, an interstate system. And as you rightly point out, non-state actors have been driving international law since we knew we had international law. Um, and then the second one is a new vocabulary for colonialism, because we have that wonderful quote up there on the board. We know that that's, that's Westphalia put into, into practice. And you are you identifying that's the, the, the result of a Westphalian perspective, so we need another one. But what, what are these conceptual tools that enable us to start dealing with analyzing non-state actors within international law and, um, and colonialism? Thank you very much, Professor Ali. It was very privileged listening to you. So um, you said international law is all about dates, right? So you can know that yesterday, the 20th of November, the ICC prosecutor indicated that she yes. wants to yeah. investigate yeah. Afghanistan, which would 
provide a real shift in terms of, for the first time, you know, looking at the crimes of the US military and the CIA. How do you perceive this sure. as possibly having a really positive effect? Sure. And then secondly, a Kenyan friend of mine, um, who's an international criminal lawyer, made an interesting comment about the, the colonialist nature of the ICC, which is that it gives African states more of a platform than they've had in a long time sure. to be really vocal and, and have a voice, sort of, um, you can, you know, uh, look at your uh, example of Colombia and, you know, a false voice, but this could possibly be a true voice. I mean, I'd be curious to hear your, your view of <coughs> suggestions to start an African criminal court. And then finally, just uh, 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 connecting to what Kathy just said, um, I was wondering why, you know, corporations should have status because they resemble an international before, because they resemble states. Yeah. You surely be trying to move away from a state-centered system, right? So the state should not be, be the measure of all things. So we should think of other reasons why corporations should be held accountable. Oh, okay, my name is Mia Swart. Sure, uh, so thank you. Those are, two, uh, those are two questions I'm very searching. So in terms of um, how we should con conceive of the Westphalian uh, paradigm. Um, so I claim that the Westphalian paradigm is about equal and sovereign states. And I feel that if you look at the works of all the major thinkers in international law, uh, this is an assumption that they have made. So if we look at the work of Sir Hirsch you know, he wrote a, a wonderful book about the, the role of law in the international community. For him, the great problem was politics. In other words, there should be the rule of law, but states are self-interested they're aggressive, and so the task is to create a system of institutions and so forth that will control states. Now the interesting thing is that Sir Hirsch also wrote about colonialism, because he wrote about a particular institution that here in South Africa is something that um, uh, many of you might be familiar with, the mandate system. Because after all, South Africa had a mandate for Southwest Africa, and that generated a huge, you know, a huge litigation it involved every aspect of the UN system, the General Assembly, the Security Council, the 1971 case, the 1966 case. Um, and uh, it was also very important because um, the whole question of apartheid uh, played a role in the interpretation of Article 27 of the UN Charter, which is an article which basically says the United Nations cannot interfere in the domestic jurisdiction of the state. So, uh, so we can see uh, those, uh, you know, we can uh, see uh, those uh, uh, aspects uh, in terms of uh, looking at, you know, how. Uh, so my basic claim about, about her, Sir Hirsch Lauterpacht is, he see, he wrote about those issues, but he didn't see that as a major theoretical question. He didn't feel that imperialism told us something fundamental about international law itself. So this is what I mean by saying that it is theory that is important. So it is almost as though the West has theory, the non-West has the raw material in some way, uh, in which might be assimilated into these other theories. And the question I would ask is, how is that assimilation you know, to be enacted? But you're quite right in saying there's a lot of new scholarship being done about Westphalia. And uh, some scholars are making exactly the argument you're making, saying Westphalia was about imperialism within Europe itself. So now uh, this is part of a huge movement towards rethinking the history of international law. So we go back to Professor Beinart, you know, talking about how we should understand that past in terms of developments in the present. In terms of uh, what sort of conceptual structures we would think of as alternatives, so one I would suggest is the idea of the civilizing mission. And I think uh, that continues to be a, a factor which drives a lot of international law. I might merge that with the question of the ICC. So, uh, I'm delighted to see that now finally action is being taken in relation to Afghanistan. But otherwise, um, you know, the ICC fitted in with what I would call a typical pattern where international law is made in the non-Western world. That is the barbaric world, that is the place where these savages, these war criminals uh, are to be found. And of course, Africa has attracted so many of the states, uh, or so many of the cases, isn't it? That, tip, that to me exemplifies what I would call the civilizing vision. And you create these new institutions and uh, international law advances in order to civilize the barbaric. Now of course there's a complication to that argument, it's not a complication, but it's interesting that 
after all, the international criminal law in its modern form begins with Nuremberg. That's when the most civilized people in the world, the country of Goethe, Bach, Beethoven, turns out to be completely barbaric. You know, that's where international law begins, international criminal law begins. But, so that's why I said, we, I'm not trying to dismiss Westphalia completely. I'm not trying to do that. I'm saying we need this additional thing to understand how this dynamic plays out. And it is a way of recognizing, and to me, the problem is that we don't recognize the way in which imperialism operates. If we don't recognize it in the first place, then we can't really devise a set of uh, techniques or technologies to address the problem. And so in that context, I would say all these Westphalian institutions we've been talking about are important. Like, you know, if we can identify these problems, then hopefully something like the International Criminal Court or the United Nations can devise ways of addressing these problems. But unless we have a vocabulary which enables us to recognize the operation of this particular dynamic of forces, we can't really hope that international law will address them in some respect. So that's the way I would see the relationship between, you could say, a trail approach which tries continuously to see the way in which subordination is ongoing. <clears throat> and if you talk about decolonization, uh, I would say a, a, a very good friend of mine, his name is B.S. Jimmy, an Indian scholar, he says, uh, it's a different type of colonialism we're dealing with. It is not rich countries and poor countries. It is not that colonialism. It is the colonialism of rich people and poor people. And surely you can see that as being a fundamental aspect of our modern existence. The top 100, the, my, my father keeps sending me these emails, uh, and I should uh, pay more attention to you know, the more technical ones, but something like, the headline was something like the top 100 people, top hundred richest people in the world have more wealth than 60% of the world's population. <coughs> we are living in a period of unprecedented inequality. We are living in a period of just a massive env and ongoing environmental degradation. There are these ongoing wars, people being displaced. And so the question is, has, have, the, have the techniques that were really generated through the imperial encounter, are they now actually becoming more global, such that it is not race alone anymore that dictates who is the colonizer? That would help us understand the relationship between imperialism and this particularly pathological system in which we seem to be living in, in which there are these massive inequalities. Now, there again, people could disagree with me, saying, no, this is a wonderful world that we're living in, and there is so much progress, and you know, uh, I have in my hand uh, uh, a device which is more sophisticated than anything that existed in 1970 or whatever it is. You know, extraordinary progress has been made. And yet, there seems to be this ongoing systematic marginalization. And here, I think uh, we ha perhaps have to talk about you know, who has power. Do corporations have power? How is that exercised? I think there's another uh, set of uh, issues. Uh, the Panama Papers, is that right? The mm -hmm. Panama Papers. Extraordinary, isn't it? How corporations seem to have all these rights that individuals or even states don't seem to have. And there is a law that creates that structure. It is not outside the law. It is the law which even by its omissions allows certain actions to take place. And can we see that as being a manifestation of Westphalian sovereignty? Each country saying, well, we have complete right, the complete right to establish whatever tax system we choose. Isn't that Westphalian sovereignty? Can we see that? So we can see it's a complex system of, you know, Westphalian sovereignty as having potential, and I'm using a broad term, Westphalian sovereignty, which I don't like, but I guess, uh, you know, classic international law, conventional international law has to take important steps, but it has to also recognize what the problems are. And there might be some problems with classical international law itself. Because as we see from this uh, slide, it is not that third world countries are lacking in sovereignty, it is that they are, deprived of their sovereignty because of the particular idea of concept of sovereignty that was developed in the West, in relation to which all other forms of political organization are regarded as inferior or lacking in any kind of status. So perhaps here, um, quite apart from conceptual tools, we might have to start thinking about other forms of human society and interaction. Um, I think of uh, you know, Professor Viramantri's uh, judgment in the Gabshikova case, where he talks about uh, more traditional societies and their relationship with the environment. 
so it's something of a cliche, but I still think it's worth repeating that this idea that the, that the environment is property, that it is a commodity, is uh, actually a fairly specific idea which has become universalized in various ways because of colonialism, I would say, to the point where now that's regarded as the universal truth. But perhaps there are other ways of thinking about the environment, and anthropology and history and other societies suggest this. And perhaps we need to think about those other societies and those other, you could say, potentials that they offer, because I'm not sure whether we can continue very much in the mode that we are continuing on now. Um, in terms of the International Criminal Court, um, I think I've mentioned uh, something already. Um, and I, I, I feel I have mixed feelings about this debate. I don't have any sort of specific position. But it's a classic situation of, we, of international law as being something like, give it time, it will work. Now, it's an interesting thing that we see the same pattern repeated quite often in relation to developing countries. The argument <clears throat> is, all right, it hasn't worked for you yet, but keep going, try better. Fail better. No, that's... Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, but... Uh, uh, well, try better in the hope of succeeding. This idea of an endlessly deferred process by which we hope that law finally will come good. If only we had the right people. If only. If only. What if the problem is the law itself? Because then, if the problem is perhaps in, uh, vested in the law itself, the expansion of that deficient law will simply reproduce the problem, if not make it worse. So we need a set of conceptual tools that will help us understand what's good about the law and what's bad about the law. And in a trail, we are trying to develop those conceptual tools. And we don't see it by any means as being a complete process. We've only been in existence for 21 years, which is actually in itself not a bad achievement, I think. Um, and uh, we're hoping to hold a few more conferences, and you're welcome to come uh, if this is of interest uh, to you in these uh, particular circumstances. Thank you, Professor Angwin. You are now all invited to drinks downstairs on the fourth floor, and you can continue the conversation with Professor Angwin. Thank you very much.